<laughs> All right. Um, so I will share my screen. And um, I think we are pretty much ready to start today. Um, so I really want to welcome everyone joining us tonight. Um, this session is in particular special because um, we had Laura previously, but it's not just about this. Um, Laura is a very integral part of the whole approach, um, how we have developed Evitat. Evitat is a platform solution for conscious home renovation, really empowering renovators and homeowners to make healthy and low carbon and build climate ready homes. So um, I had many conversations with Laura and, um, and a lot of her knowledge she shared has went also into some of the solutions we have created. And I'm very excited actually to hear tonight her story um, about the impossible house and actually making um, amazing progress and decisions in the middle of Sydney to going off grid and having a small footprint as possible. So let me just... So before we dive deeper, I just want to do an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Evitat acknowledges the traditional custodians of country and land throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aborigine and Torres Strait Islanders people today. We are in particular here to listen, learn and build a future together. So I welcome Dr. Laura Ryan, um, probably one of the most passionate persons, renovators I've met so far, and sharing really her story about um, going off grid in the middle of Sydney and um, wanting really to create a low carbon, healthy and um, small footprint home. And we will listen today um, around all the obstacles and how to overcome them. And it's a very, very interesting journey with a lot of insights and learnings for others. I also want to, um, to welcome John Cayley from Ecological Design, a consultancy providing sustainable design services, also thermal modeling and basics, um, including also water balance modeling and design of rainwater harvesting systems, which is quite critical um, to the entire project Laura is intending to achieve. And we will hear far more details to the solution as well. And then we have Simona Schenko, Green Eco Design, passive house expert and a vital supporter also of Evitat. Um, Simona, I'm very, very happy to have <laughs> you here tonight as well. And um, quite um, excited actually that you will be hosting this session. And myself, I'm co-founder and CEO of Evitat. Like I mentioned, um, platform solution for conscious home renovation. And we will tap a little bit more towards the end of the session and I will explain the benefits, um, what you can do with the platform and how can you actually utilize the, the core benefits as well. So um, Simona, I will hand it over to you. We yep. will have a little introduction <clears throat> for Laura and John and then we will dive deeper. Yeah, awesome. So, so I just want to say I'm personally so excited to have you here again, Laura, because we had you here, I think, like <clears throat> almost a year ago, is that possible? And yeah, just to see what you have done. And I found you so inspiring because you're uncompromising. You know, you want to make it work and you want to show ours how it's work. And, you know, that you share everything that you learn in your knowledge is just truly inspiring. So, yeah, very good to have you here. And also, you know, John, to hear how you tackle this challenge. Uh, but maybe over to you, Laura, if you can maybe give a bit of introduction about yourself. You know, who are you? Why are you doing this? You know, why are you so passionate about this? And then, you know, we hand over to John before we go into the, you know, the proper details. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a finance professional um, bumbling my way through uh, this sustainable house renovation. And, you know, the reason that I wanted to do this was because most of us, live in the city in high density areas 
And I think a lot of us want to live sustainably and it's easy to live sustainably when you've got a big block and you've got a, a lot of money to spend, um, uh, especially, you know, out in, in rural areas, it's it's much easier. But, you know, as I mentioned, we all live in, in the city and we don't have that spare $5 million. I think also, you know, sustainability has a bit of an image problem. So when I talked to my friends about building a sustainable house, they ask me weird questions like, so cold showers is, is is the toilet <laughs> toilet out the back? Um, do you need a, a stick to you know kill the snake the snakes with? And you know so <laughs> so I think I'm trying to combat nice. that <laughs> as well. So you know I don't want my house to be daggy because I want other people to copy it. Um, and it, the other thing I think people are worried about is the amount of effort that's involved in researching mm. this and this kind of thing. And um, look, it, there is a lot of effort that that goes into it. And so. The other thing that I want to do is document all of my mistakes, um, put them up on my website um, so that other people don't make those mistakes and um, throw their money away into the money pit like like I have. So, you know, overall, if you can, um, you know, follow my journey along and, and pick up, you know, a few things here, here and there, even if it's just a couple of things, you don't do, the, you know, the whole thing. Um, and, you know, if I can demonstrate that, this can be done on a really, really small block. Um, and if I can do it on this super small block, then hopefully anybody can can do it on theirs. And, you know, if there's just, you know, one thing that maybe you might take away from this and then go and implement, then I feel like I've I've done done my job. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, very inspiring. So we're going to uh, dive into it shortly. Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about you? You know, how did you start? You know, what you're doing now? Why are you passionate about it? And, yeah. How how has that all come about? <laughs> uh, thanks, Simone. So I I suppose I've had a, a lifelong um, bent towards sustain sustainability that probably my parents um, uh, imbued us with very early on. I, I was one of um, five kids, and we quickly came to have a, a great appreciation of you know the Australian bush, the natural environment, growing things at home, and, and generally being um, conservers uh, at home. More recently, I when I started on this course, was, I was I'd been working as a, a landscaper for nine years, and it was getting to the end of a long drought. And so we were, as well as putting in watering systems for people, we started. It was the beginning of when rainwater tanks were allowed again. So we started putting rainwater tanks, and so I started designing rainwater harvesting systems. And then some of the clients got very particular about getting the tank sizes right. So then. Mm. I, I sort of worked out uh, some software so that I could more accurately and, and sensibly size rainwater tanks compared to what was available at the, at the time. And, and it sort of started from there. <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. Definitely doing great work uh, there. And sorry, so let, maybe let's dive a bit deeper into the topic. And before we talk um, over, over the rainwater. So Laura, can you maybe give us a bit of an overview? You know, what is the impossible house? You know, and obviously it's your passion project. So, you know, when and how was it started? And, you know, what are your goals? So I had the idea around 2015, I think. And then I purchased uh, this crappy little house in in Newtown this dark and dingy um, cottage with no light and um, and then around I guess 2019 after quite a bit of research um, I really then started to engage the sustainability experts mm -hmm. um, and the goal is to eventually go completely off the grid um, so disconnect from the mains um, no sewage, so I have an in incinerating toilet um, and I want to disconnect um, from the electricity grid uh, mm -hmm. eventually as well. So um, I'll have a battery um, and all the while I'm documenting the whole thing so that people can follow along and, as I mentioned, not make the same mistakes um, because the mistake, the actual solution itself is not that expensive. <laughs> the really finding ex it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the really expensive part is finding the right people. And the, I have spent way more on consultants 
um, and engineers than I have on the actual thing that I'm implementing. So <laughs> I don't want other people to go through that pain because it's really painful. So, um, mm. you know, that's the, that's the whole po point here. Um, it's called the impossible house because there's so many people that I've come across that I've asked to help me do this that have told me that it's impossible because the block is so small, it's facing mm. the wrong direction. Um, we've got to get through all the count um hurdles it took me so long to find people like john that would try to actually help me usually it was no or you can't do that or you know it's impossible so um mm. i don't think it's impossible now two years ago i felt like it was impossible but mm. probably yeah i think i think it's laura <laughs> you know 10 now and the house is 15 and then hopefully um at the end it'll be laura 25 and then the house is you know <laughs> 20 or something like that oh, <laughs> I love that to be honest um <laughs> maybe on the note of of a small block in, even um I think everything is relative um because like um coming from Europe having the European background there are some amazing actually small block solutions even for entire families and I think um being smart about the, the the block, the size, and utilizing it to the best possible outcomes is a great way to to look into um, opportunities actually to to build and rebuild. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And, and like you said, Laura, you know, I think that the time of the you know the 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 big Australian home with the big block and the freestanding home, it's it's coming to an end. You know, we have to live in the cities more because. There is no point, you know, if you live on a nice block and you have to commute one or two hours every day, you know, that's also not sustainable, not really living. But, you know, how can we make this housing stock, you know, actually, how can we bring it into the next century? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big task. But, yeah, um, like we said before, you've been here about a year ago. So can you tell us what, what happened during the year, you know, what happened with council, uh, what has been done and, you know, what's happening currently on site? Uh, yeah, so... The things that have been roadblocks were the construction certificate um, and getting sign off on the water recycling design. Um, mm. So we made we made some errors. We didn't know quite who to get to sign off on things, and then um, turned out we could have. Um, I think you could have signed off on it, right, John? Is that? that correct and we were searching for a different type of engineer and we didn't actually need to look for that type of engineer and then uh, what who, who was it oh you're on mute john a um another architect um on a, a subsequent job had the same sort of condition from council saying it had to be a civil engineer and she preemptively had already written to them to get a variation on that condition which is what we asked our certifier to do and and so they council did that and then I was able to sign that one off. Yeah, so that put a bit of a delay um, on things. <laughs> and uh, what else has, has delayed us? Oh, then we had, um, we weren't sure if we needed to get a Section 68 um, uh, certificate as well for the water recycling solution. Turns out that we didn't need to do that. So all of these things, we just don't know what we don't know. And so we then we just kind of, you know, again, bumble along. Um, in terms of where we're at at the moment, though, so tonight the prefab is getting shipped up. Oh, and awesome. it's installed tomorrow, so woohoo! I'm out. I'm going to go out and um, watch that happen. Um, we've ordered the sustainable uh, wallpaper. Um, the kind of half of the water recycling solutions in. So we've got the um, tanks and the grey water tank, um, but the actual grey water recycling system um, hasn't gone in yet. Um, and there's a yeah, there's a bit of a story about the location of of that, which has uh, has caused me some some headaches as well, uh, which I'll share uh, later, I guess, when you ask me more questions about that. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Uh, maybe let's do a little bit of a shout out as well. So who are you getting the prefabricated panels from? Ah uh, yes, yeah. so Paul Adams from Fairweather Homes, and um, yeah, I have to I have to give Paul uh, two big thumbs up because I am the most irritating <laughs> client because I have asked him to change the drawings, you know, forty seven million times, and <laughs> he keeps he keeps doing it, and you know, John's very accommodating as well, and you know, I. I know I'm annoying, John, but thank you to John and Paul and Denby and Dean for, you know, accommodating all of my changes and trying mm. to make this this work. And I think that's that's important. You have to have the right people on the project. 
definitely. And I think, like you said, you know, there are so many challenges because it's just something that has never been done before. So I imagine, you know, you can't go to the website or to council and say, what do I have to do in this in, in, uh, <laughs> instance? You know, there is not a tick because probably they don't even know what they're doing. And so if you put them something in front of them that they have never done, they probably just need a month to think about what the reply back to you is. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. That, but, that literally happens. So we make yeah. phone calls and... The, the, yeah, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, yeah, I can imagine. But, you know, that's the good thing is, you know, you're, you're documenting it. So hopefully if someone else wants to do the same thing, they can see, yeah, you know, you might not know what you need to do, but here's something I prepared earlier or here's something someone else has prepared earlier. So hopefully that, that will be quite amazing. Um, so you talked a little bit about the challenges you had already, you know, with the permits and the delays. <clears throat> but can you uh, dive a little bit more into the challenges you had? I probably it was mainly around the water, right? Yeah, the water is has been the most expensive, the most difficult, the most frustrating <laughs> aspect of it. So um, I've had, uh, I think, three consultants um, uh, most recently help me on it. The, f the very first one um, came up with the solution. It took about a year to develop. Um, and then the, the cost of the solution came in at $200,000, I think it was. And um, part of the goal or one of the goals of, of the project is that I want to make this accessible to, to people. So a $200,000 solution wasn't going to, to cut it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I had to abandon that. So that was, you know, kind of a year out of the project. Mm -hmm. And and uh, let's not talk about how much money it cost me <laughs> as well. So let's move on from that. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was just really frustrating because um, really what, what I should have done was figure out what the water recycling requirements were first and then design the house around it. Um, mm. But we had designed the house and then we're trying to fit the, the water recycling system in. And mm. um, so that's a big piece of advice to everyone. If you're going to do this, you know, talk to people like John first and then, um, then you start talking to the architects. So um, everyone thinks that you talk to the architect first but I would say no don't do it like that <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so for instance can you describe what the challenge was in your instance you know is it where the house is located or where your your garden area is located or you know can you go into specific what was difficult with your design it's the space so you need quite a few um tanks and mm -hmm. you need to figure out a place to put them so yep. um if you don't have the option of, you know, excavating and then putting mm. water tanks um, under your house like we're, we're yep. doing, then it's going to be really, really difficult. So um, that was uh, that part of it. The, the other issue was um, in the first solution, um, we needed to have space for um, us to release um, excess water out of the system um, periodically so that salt wouldn't build up in, in the um, uh, recycled water and then ruin my plants mm. or, you know, ruin the washing machine. Um, and so the issue there was that we needed to have a, a trench underneath the house and then we, we needed that trench to be able to absorb water at a certain rate and it, it didn't look like it was going to because there was lots of clay. Um, and so, you know, that that was a pain in the neck. And then, um, but, you know, now we've got a solution that um, John has designed and it's a lot less complicated. Mm. Um, it's definitely a lot more affordable. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to be putting that um, solution up on, on the website. Um, mm. So I think that, I think what this has really taught me is that there isn't just one solution and you do need to be, a little bit pushy if something comes in and it's ridiculously costly mm. really ask well, I, there has to be another way um and you know and I didn't know what the other way was and uh, you yeah. know I was telling telling you guys before the 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 process of finding John was quite I don't know it's funny now but not so funny when it was happening so <laughs> you know I was spending so much money on it I was wasting years trying to find someone that could help me with the solution then I had you know enrolled in all of these off-grid courses in California and in other places. I was talking to all these off-grid specialists. And then finally I posted a, a question on the Evertat platform and Caroline Pidcock said, um, talk to John Cayley. Uh, 
he he lives up the road from you in Newtown. So <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But anyway, I found John. So yeah, full circle that happened. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe, maybe yeah. next time you have to put a poster on the street. I'm looking for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> the local search. Um, yes. Maybe on um, like because we are like at the moment um, these are renderings. Like I know that they have been done in an early phase. Um, but maybe just to make it very clear to people, um, there's really no um, connection actually to the water supply. Um, everything is pretty much under the house. And um, you mentioned the trench. Um, so I'm really curious to, to hear more um, what kind of solution and what, what you have done actually, um, John, to, to figure out how to manage that part. Um, we have a house in Queensland and I know um, we opted in for um, an environmentally friendly solution, um, but it needs actually a fair bit of area for, for the trench. So, yeah, I'm very curious to, to hear actually more about that. Yeah. Good. That's, I think, the perfect handover to John. So, uh, you know, can give us, can you give us a little bit of an overview, you know, what are the specifics or challenges, you know, if someone wants to go off the grid with the entire water supply and, you know, in particular, what have you done with Laura? You know, what's the best solution for her? What are you doing with her? Yes. So um, it, each um, site has its own challenges. In Laura's case, um, so for the water cycle, we've got um, the water that comes onto the site and then and then um, what happens on the site and then um, how we deal with the wastewater. So mm -hmm. the water that comes on is the rain and, and Sydney is blessed with a fairly large rainfall, although it, it's also <laughs> yeah. quite variable. So we had you know over two metres of rain in 2022, I think it was, mm -hmm. the huge year. But um, we have had as little as five, uh, half a metre of, so one quarter of that in a year. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a variable rainfall supply, but it, it typically um, won't be more than, say, one month without rain. So we, we compared to somewhere that um, gets all its rain in one season, like, so, say, um, Darwin or even mm. Perth to an extent, Sydney's got some natural advantages. Mm. Um, and then uh, so we... We, we're getting the water is coming off the roof and it's um, getting some filtration and, and screening and then into the tanks. And uh, our challenge, our particular challenge with this site is that there is a jacaranda overhanging a lot of the roof and they are just mm -hmm. notorious for putting a lot of nutrients into um, rainwater, both off the flowers and off the leaves. And and that will be a challenge and we, we have to think about um, how we deal with that if um, we get a lot of nutrients in there and they're in, in tanks with not much air, you can get the whole lot of the water going um, anaerobic and that's something that mm. might come up. Hopefully, if it's getting used fairly steadily, you can get enough turnover that it, that it might not happen. But we have um, a plan that if need be, we can um, flush the tanks out and and it's it's okay to, to let that water go into the stormwater system. Um, so that's that's our plan for that. Um, even with uh, the amount of the roof area that we've got in the rainfall, our, our modelling shows that if um, it was just collecting rainwater and then using it for everything, Laura would run out at times uh, and that would make disconnecting difficult. So one thing that Laura had already planned before she came to me was saying she's going to use a composting toilet. So that takes the demand for toilet flushing out of the equation. So that's a, it's a significant chunk of any sort of in-house usage, you know, typically maybe 15% or something. And then um, we're also going to treat the the grey water, which is what's left because we don't have toilet waste. So we've got grey water and we're going to treat that. And then when you put grey water through a, a grey water treatment system, the requirements just in New South Wales, it has to be treated to like an A plus quality water. And then you can wash your clothes with it. You can um, use it for irrigation quite easily. It doesn't have to be subsurface irrigation. So it can just be used as a normal sort of irrigation supply for the garden. So um, that means that with everything going well, probably Laurel will almost never, ever run out of water, hopefully, um, with such a, a small actual demand of new water coming into the system. Um, never say never, but 
it, it looks pretty good. Um, on the on the then on the, the the water coming outside and the salt build up, so that is potentially an issue still. So it, you need Laura needs to be watching what she uses for her laundry detergent. So uh, particularly powders can have a lot of salt in them, but you can also choose powders that have very low amount of sodium in them. Or if you go to laundry liquids, typically um, they they they're very low in in sodium anyway. Um, I, I haven't checked what the sheets are like because we've started using you know the the laundry sheets at home, and I haven't I haven't seen. I have to look at the data and what they're like in terms of uh, sodium content. So that is something you have to watch. Um, some will go so that the water that's coming from the washing machine. So I couldn't hear you there. Is that just me or yeah, it's John just I, robot? I can't hear John anymore. Maybe it's audio. Simone, yeah, I can't you can hear, hear me. Yep. Can you maybe try again, John? Let's let's try one more time. If not, we might go back to Laura for a little bit. No, I we lost him. Dial back in. Yeah, might be best. Um, maybe, uh, Laura, you can even tell us a little bit about it. Do you know what you're using for your drinking water? You know, how you're making sure that you can use the water in the kitchen? Uh, yeah, so we're using um, a grey water recycling system called Aquaclaris. Mm. And um, uh, there's some uh, an interesting story about the location of that. I don't know if you want, to, want me to talk about that now or, or the at a later um oh, maybe, maybe, maybe so, you can go there you know talk about it while we wait for um yeah so i mentioned that you know you should you, you want to design the house around all your off-grid mm. um solutions so originally we had done that um mostly <laughs> um but more recently um not only did the water recycling um system change um uh, but the location of where we needed to put the actual grey water recycling system had changed from out the back of the house where you couldn't kind of see it um, mm. to uh, now the proposal is to have it in the courtyard. <laughs> and also during this very long drawn out process, um, it turned out that the place that we were going to put the battery um, councils have changed the rules now and we're not allowed to, to keep it there. So we have to move that. And then the, the, um, the suggestion is for that to go in the courtyard as well. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, one of the, so I have two competing objectives. One is, you know, go off the grid and be sustainable. Um, and then the other is not to have a daggy, ugly house <laughs> and for it to be beautiful. But I don't know if I can do that if I have a big battery and a big mm. water recycling um, <laughs> in the middle, of, right in the middle <laughs> of my courtyard. So, so, um, so I've done that thing where I, I'm being pushy again and I'm asking the team to figure out how to get the grey water recycling system out the back. Um, so that the courtyard can be free of that. And then we're hopefully moving the battery um, up to the second um, floor so that the, the courtyard will remain. That picture there that you can see is the um, grey water tank. Mm. Um, and I, I, um, the, all of the other tanks um, around it are the um, actual rain, rainwater tanks. And then uh, obviously the, um, the, the water will go through the... Um, a grey water recycling system and then we can use that on um, the garden and, and the washing machines. But, yeah, the, the potable water will, will go into the tanks through a fil filtration system. Awesome. Laura, and can I just ask you one thing um, in terms of the tank water um, for, like, you're using it for, for as drinking water. Um, you got that under the house, um, so it's pretty much sheltered from the heat and and other things are you still like are you using a filter system um yeah 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 so um john uh will be able to explain it better than me but there's the uh, first flush diverters um and then i think there's another um filtration system as well mm -hmm. um but he did say that because 
of the um, jacaranda trees, there is a high probability that the water might become anaerobic. And so mm. I have to keep making sure that I keep mixing the water around. So pouring small, more, small amounts of water in and, and um, mixing it around so that that doesn't um, happen. And uh, also John has specified that um, Dean, um, Dean King, my, my builder um, has put uh a ridiculous amount of valves and um, access points <laughs> to the to the tanks, so that we don't, uh, so we minimise the chance of, I guess, the the water becoming um, anaerobic and, and mm. not usable. Because I don't, John said that I would have to empty it all out and start again if yeah. that did did happen. So um, yeah, I want to avoid that because, well, for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de definitely. Um, avoiding it is the best way to to basically go. Like we have never actually had the the situation to flush out the the tanks, but I'm pretty convinced it has also to do with the location of the tanks. Um, they are in our case positioned under the house, which keeps them away from the harsh um sun and the heat. So again, um, you have cold um, storage basically of, of the water tanks and makes a huge difference in, in the water quality as well. And then of course, here and there you you should be testing um, just to make sure, but we don't like, we don't really have um, any greenery around. Like <laughs> a lot <laughs> has been removed, unfortunately. <laughs> during cyclones and um, not because we wanted it, but um, just in a natural way, but it added probably to the water quality as well. Yeah. What happens and maybe if something just... goes wrong in, oh, sorry. No, no, you, you go. Um, yeah, I guess one of the concerns that I had, Sonia, was if something goes wrong, I needed to be able to access the, the tanks. So do mm. you, uh, what do you do for yours? Well, we have complete access. So they are on the lower point um, under the house. So there's a five meter height um, and they're quite big. Um, so we have all around access. Like if something would go wrong, we could just um, flush them completely out in, into the backyard. <laughs> but um, yeah, that of course, this is... Um, a benefit um, actually being more rural um, or maybe not rural, but more regional on the larger block of land. And um, when we built that, um, we didn't know much, but I think then there was a smart moment actually to decide to put them under the house really far for the quality. Um, but we had a bit of advice also um, from family members who basically said, no, keep it really shaded and um, it will add basically to the water quality so here we are um, in all these nearly 15 years or it's good I think a good 15 years that we have built the house um, we didn't have at any point the need actually to flush out the, the entire thing yeah. Um, yeah, just thought, you know, even if we jump topic a little bit, because, you know, you were just mentioning your builder. So uh, what criteria did you actually use to finally settle on a builder? Because, you know, you talked with so many people and so many said, you know, that's impossible. You can't do this. So how did you find the right one? So I actually found Dean and the team through Denby, my designer. Um, and uh, Denby is another one of those people that, uh, says yes instead of no whenever I ask for <laughs> weird th weird things. Um, and she had been working with Dean uh, for quite a long period of time. And then I met him and the team and, um, you know, he was definitely uh, somebody that was keen to um, achieve what I, I wanted to achieve. So, you know, he the fact that he's working with someone who I'd been working with for so long and that person trusted that person was, was important um, to me um, because, you know, I, a lot of the time that I started working with people um, and they weren't referred to me, I just kind of, you know, got onto the Google and found them that way, then they didn't always work out. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, referrals and working with the trusted people of the people that you trust <laughs> seems to be a good way to to do it that seems to be a good model yeah 
No, that's perfect. And Sean, I'm just wondering, because you, you got short before, was there something you wanted to add or did you pretty much say what you wanted to say? Um, no, I, I hadn't quite finished. So I was going to say about how the grey water, um, the salt issue um, yep. could be addressed and as well as um, making sure not much of salt is going into the mm -hmm. system, then we're also, there, there'll be more treated grey water than, than we can possibly use on the site. So some will be leaving and that will be carrying some of the salt with, with it. It'll be treated to an A plus quality water. Mm -hmm. and, and when you think about it, um, the amount of water that falls onto the site, it, it's natural that a certain amount of it leaves as well. Um, it, it would be quite unnatural if it all sort of hit that site and, and none of it ever left again. So yeah, it's going to leave in as you know as good quality as it as it goes in. John, can I ask? Um, actually, like looking at at the plan here, um, in terms of the size of the system, how much space does it take? The rainwater system. Yeah. So each of the rectangular um, uh, under deck tanks are sort of two and a half meters long by a meter and a half wide. Okay. Um, so and they each hold two thousand liters. So because we're constrained vertically, we've only got a certain amount of height. Um, that's what we could fit, and we also had a tight constraint in terms of the tanks have to overflow back to the the stormwater drainage system, yep. which is the gutter level. So that was um, it's quite a tight um, bit step managing to stay under the floors of the the house, which is the same as the existing house, and and get back to the front curb. So that was mm -hmm. tricky okay. as well. Oh, yeah. actually, that one caused me a panic, John, didn't it? Because <laughs> if it didn't, we couldn't do it. <laughs> so there there was also um, the option of um, exercising a ride over a. A, um, a service lane to another street, which is much lower. It's mm. just other neighbours had built over it in multiple points, so it might have been quite difficult. Um, but that would have been the backup. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. I had started investigating that, and um, the feedback was that it would take me years to be able to get the permission to do it. Um, so that, to me, is means no I couldn't couldn't do it um and uh yeah then I would have to get all of the neighbors um to agree um and then I would have to you know change the plans with the council and um that I think that was just going to be a, a nightmare and so really it was yeah back out onto to Margaret Street in front of the house or nothing <laughs> so yeah yeah and that's uh, sure if I was have seen um Daniel's uh, message that John might leave us soon because he doesn't have to stick around the whole time. So if anyone has any questions for John, please put them in the chat box just that we can make sure we can address them. I've got one for John. Um, I think I <laughs> answered the question about the um, the filtration uh, poorly. So I know there's the first flush diverter. What is there anything else that we have um, in the that we have filtering the water before it gets into the tanks, John? So before it gets into the tanks, we have, first of all, it goes to a leaf shedding rain head, which is like a fine one millimetre stainless steel mesh. And that gets all the actual leaves and sticks and, and gross matter out, and which means that Laura Duck doesn't have to deal with it going into her tanks because because of the levels, the, the pipe doesn't go through an inlet strainer on the way into the tank. It's just going straight into the tank. Then it goes past the first flush diverter, which will take out some of the dissolved um, dust and, and yeah, mostly dissolved dust. So um, stuff that's um, not, not so much chemicals as just um, stuff that would become sediment in the bottom of the tank. Then we our plan is that all the, the rainwater will directly go into one tank and that's where our sediment will build up and we'll draw our, our water out of a different tank which will have less sediment in it. So just by that simple thing, that will reduce what we take off to then go through. There'll be um, effectively three filters before it gets to usage. So we, we won't filter any water that's just going directly out to a, a garden tap, but what's going into the house will go through um, two sediment filters. So one's um, a coarser one, and these are very big filters so that they have lots of surface area so they don't reduce the flow too much. So it'll go through a 20 micron and then a, and then a five micron um, sediment filter. 
And then just the drinking water outlets will also go through um, a sub one micron absolute filter. So that's a very that's a very fine filter, but that will also take out um, all the bacteria. It'll take out any um, lead, and take out cryptosporidium and giardia, all those sort of things. So that we're confident that um, the the drinking water that comes out of that tank will be fit for human drinking. Jim, can I ask you, are these filters like ceramic filters or what are they made of um, in terms of to, to basically um, generate that water quality? Yeah, the, the sediment filters are usually a polyspun mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of pleated filter. And then the sub one micron, I, I typically like a ceramic one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty much got a, a, a less than one micron pore size in it. And it also means it can be scrubbed clean and then put back in again. We had a we had a pretty lengthy conversation about whether the um, taps in the bathroom um, would be drinking water or not, and you know where the location of the filters would be. Um, so that meant that Denby had to work with John to figure out again another uh, visually. Uh, appealing <laughs> solution that was accommodating <laughs> my off-grid requirements, but um, we sorted it out. So. Yeah, essentially, the, there's no um, cabinetry under the the bathroom basin, so you you do need to filter to a the cold side of the bathroom basin tap because it's going to, you know, people are going to brush their teeth and maybe mm -hmm. have a drink of water out of it, and normally that filter can go you know, in the cabinetry if there's one there, but in this case, we'll just have to filter it. I think beside the kitchen one, so we'll put the filter and and run the line from there to the bathroom, and that will work. Yeah. Lots of things to consider, and obviously you have to think about where will the pipe go. You know where 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 everything is hidden <laughs> that that you that your house still looks nice and not just like you know cable and stuff everywhere. <laughs> and, and also, um, in this case with filters, you know they need to be set up so that they're easy to mm. um, service. It's no point having yeah. filters that you can't um, take out conveniently and, and service. Really important part, because um, I've seen also filters, um, I, I I don't know, like covered um, in cabinetry and basically no access <laughs> anymore, um, which is really weird. Um, but I guess uh, sometimes um, new owners might have other ideas um, around cabinets. <laughs> And and then you have all of a sudden these um things you know happening, but um yeah, it's it's a really important point to consider yep. and um a very yep. important point in particular if if you have a solution like that. Yeah. Yep. And the other detail is having a, a little ball valve both sides of the filter so that when you're changing it, there's not water running out into your cabinetry. Yes. No, <laughs> I, I really too. wanted to highlight also this photo just to showcase even um, like the block and 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 it's really it's it's <laughs> quite tight and putting all of these solutions in in there is quite a masterpiece I think of <laughs> you know um, engineering and um, thinking through the solution so it's um, yeah. I'm actually looking forward to to see um, even how it looks like, but it will probably all disappear with the next stage as well. Yeah, I think it almost feels like a Tetris game. You know, there are so many moving parts, and you have to make sure that they're all locking in perfectly. So, yeah, absolutely. And I guess you probably we talked about that already quite a bit, Laura. You know, but we had one one question here. I just want to check if you had something to add. Uh, you know, with a home like yours, where every inch counts, you know, where everything has to be figured out so well. Um, you know, how are you dealing with unexpected challenges, and you know, how are you tackling them? We talked already about you know the the, the water tanks and the filtering and the batteries. Um, but you know, are there some other things that that come on top of that, or? Uh yeah, everything goes wrong. <laughs> because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so um, I don't know what I don't know. Um, I can't, you know, really find anybody that's um, done it before. So, um, uh, you know, I don't know whether the incinerating toilet's going to use too much electricity. I don't know if I'm going to run out of um, water. 
I don't know um, if it's going to become anaerobic like John has, has um, warned against. Um, you know, things are definitely going to go wrong at, at some stage. Mm -hmm. um, through the process, I think one of the things that I should have done better um, was doing things in parallel. So um, what what seemed to happen was there was like a, I guess, a linear approach to the project. So we'd get we'd get to one um, hurdle and then we'd overcome that and then we'd move on to, to the next one. And sometimes there'd be huge lags in between mm. each of those things. And um, so what I should have been doing was um, asking everybody, okay, what else can we be doing mm. while we're waiting for the construction certificate. Um, mm. uh, and, you know, I, I, because I didn't know what was to come next, I didn't mm. know the questions to, to ask. So, mm. um, so I guess, yeah, my tip, my tips for others, are, you know, go to my website, ask me um, the questions and um, uh, yeah, try to, as much as possible, try to do things in parallel instead of, mm. instead of linear, because you'll just waste so much time. Yeah. I'm almost thinking like in your case, you know, you, you, like you said, you would need a good team from the start and then probably get everyone together in one room and workshop ideas, you know, where the, whatever John could say, ah, I need that much space here. And then the solar panel guy could say, yeah, but I need that much. And then the architect could say, exactly. ah, but I need that much space for the, for the, what, whatever, for the stairs or something. And it, it probably would be a bit of a process, but at least you, you know, could sort out things much faster. Yeah, definitely. And that's the way that we're doing it now. <laughs> Where before, <laughs> before I wasn't kind of doing it, doing it like that. Cause I, I, I definitely engaged the right people, but at the wrong time. So, you know, I did start with the architect first. And as I mentioned, I should have started with John first um, mm -hmm. and uh, with Roland, uh, the, the guy doing my um, electricity and mm -hmm. then talked to, to Paul and, and Denby. Mm -hmm. um, but I did it. Yeah. I did it around the wrong way. <laughs> so um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's things you just couldn't know. But, you know, the, the lucky thing is for everyone listening in or following your journey, you know, they can learn from your uh, <laughs> learnings. I don't want to call them anything negative. Mistakes, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, do it do it better. <laughs> yeah. But but one thing what my business coach and mentor always says, there is no, there are no mistakes. There's only feedback. You know, if things don't better. work, you just do them better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let me check. Yeah, we, we talked about quite a few things here, but maybe let's talk a little bit about the, the project itself, you know, aside, aside from water electricity, if we're looking about, you know, upcycling, recycling, you know, with the materials, you know, what is your approach there? Yeah, we're trying to recycle as much as we can, not only from the existing build, um, but, you know, other <laughs> things that, that we find. So I found, I oh, actually, Denby found this on Facebook Marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an old cast iron um, basin and um, uh, we're going to, we've just sent it off to the, um, the sandblaster and she's been experimenting with uh, these plant-based uh, paints and mm. uh, we're going to use that in the, uh, in the new colour. It's going to be royal blue. And, um, and it's going to match the incinerating toilet, which is also going to be <laughs> royal blue. I don't no, know, it's that, a that big sounds, highlight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it sounds horrible, but I've seen Denby's um, uh, other things and I, I think it's going to be fantastic. So that, it's actually getting exciting now. Like it just mm -hmm. used to be mistake, like after mistake and more <laughs> money down, you know, and now down the drain and now it's actually doing things like, oh, we're choosing blue for the, for the, for the basin. And so, yeah, now it's fun. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but but look, and, if and you I do, have... yeah, sorry, go on. No, just just really, I just want to say, you know, if you do such an exceptional house, it would be sad if you just had a standard white toilet, mm -hmm. everything white, everything looking like any normal house. So I think, you know, it it needs to be a bit different. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah, and <laughs> just to maybe to to even say, um, I I had a peek look into your Instagram feed, and you have shared here and there um a couple of smaller things around the design choices, and I think it be it it will actually um create this very quirky, full of character, mm. uh, amazing house, you know. And I can't wait to see actually when it all comes together. I think um, even the the color palette and all these um, very interesting even color matches, but even patterns. Um, so this is, 
I totally agree. It's the fun part. Um, but it's also where you put in the, you know, your your choice and the livable kind of spirit of, of the home. And um, doing this, um, they've re, like repurposed existing things, like, for example, um, this thing is, is really great. Um, I think that's brilliant. And I think you had also... Um, I don't know if you are still doing it, but um, there was also the staircase. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're that definitely doing that. staircase. Yeah. <laughs> are you still using that yeah. one? Yeah, we're definitely using that. Oh, um, amazing. It's gonna, it'll look pretty different though, Simone. So um, uh, so Denby found this one also um, in a marketplace and um, uh, it, I, I think it was near Wollongong and it turned out that um, the people selling the staircase were actually good friends with my partner 20 <laughs> something years ago. So that was weird. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so that it's going to look very, very different. And it, that was a pain in the neck for um, Paul to fit into the house as well, because, <laughs> because he, he does prefab and that's all, you know, modular, um, mm. like predetermined, it all fits together nicely. And then I'm like, and what about this staircase? <laughs> so he's <laughs> like, oh, God, all right. Um, but, yeah. yeah, so and we're going to paint it, you know, super bright colours and we've chosen mm. some really bright coloured um, sustainable um, runners to, to go up the centre of, of the stair as well. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about the staircase too, Simona. I think it's going to be That's great. Cool. And uh, just what I want to say again, you know, at the moment or, you know, in general, most people are just worried about resale value. You know, most houses are just planned, you know, they might be looking nice, but it's just resale value, what other people think. And you, I'm thinking you're doing really the opposite, which is amazing. You know, you, you do something for yourself, just for yourself, but obviously now as a showcase for what can be done to, um, for others. But, you know, it's yours and it's fully yours. And I found it really amazing. That, that's what makes the house so special as well. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it would be. Um, I'm hoping that all of, <laughs> everything that I'm doing, uh, you know, it boosts the capital value. But you know, being off off grid will save me money as as well. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it's definitely a labor of love, and uh, wasn't about making a profit. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. But has that been your goal quite from the start? You know, to be something eclectic and stand out ish, or you know, how did you start the process? <laughs> Yeah, because it's it's about challenging this sustainability image problem. Because um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, um, you know, if you look at your design, Simona, then you know people would realize, no, that's not true. You know that mm -hmm. the thing, the stuff you do is beautiful and sustainable. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people do have this idea that it's brown and beige and. Mm -hmm chickens and outdoor dunnies <laughs> and that that kind of thing so I wanted to really challenge that with you know this inner city quirky mm. um house and, and it just happens to be sustainable and you won't even know I don't mm. want anyone to walk in and go oh this is definitely a sustainable house mm. um yeah I, I just want to live in my house as if it's not not sustainable um mm. but it is sustainable yeah, amazing. And like you said, you know, many people still have the, the the thinking, you know, it needs to be an eco shack or something, or it's not sustainable. And and I'm a big believer as well. You know, any kind of style or house, no matter if ultra modern eco shack or ultra traditional, anything can be sustainable. And I, I think you know there are lots of different approaches, but the thing is always to do the best as you can on your side yes. with your budget and with your means. Yes. And I think it's it's also not sustainable you know if someone has to whatever pay an, uh, you know rip off an arm and a leg or something and you know be a mortgage until they're 90 or you know a slave to the mortgage until they're 90 that's even also not sustainable you know sometimes there need to be compromises and I think they can be quite personally you know and are different for everyone but it's amazing that people can just go and see what have you done you know what can they apply to them and you know and also to to show it's actually not impossible if there is a will there is a way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have the will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you clearly oh. have. <laughs> Laura, um, can you give us also an update actually on the whole um, topic with solar panels? Because I know that you have reached out um, several times to community to, to get support um, on the pe petition. Um, so give us a little bit, uh, maybe an overview of what's the issue. And um, and has it been moving? And um, where is the process at? 
Yes, yeah, so the image that you have up now shows the solar panels on the front roof, um, but I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> because the council says that it's ruining the, the aesthetic and, you know, the heritage constraints um, won't, let, won't let me do that. But my perspective is that we're in a climate emergency and if our houses burn down <laughs> because of the... Yeah because uh, of the climate emergency we won't have any heritage to save um, and the other thing is you know it's really it's a temporary structure um, so I'm not you know ruining the facade and and you can put it on and put it off and you, you can make them blend into to the mm. the roof and you can you know match the the color to the roof and you know those types of things um, uh, and if I can't put those solar panels on the front roof, roof, I'm really going to struggle to be off the grid. And so I have a um, petition that you can sign, please sign everyone. <laughs> but, um, it's on my, it yeah, thank you. Uh, it's on the website and also on the, on the Instagram um, account as well. So um, yeah. And thanks to you guys for um, promoting it as well. Cause after you did that, got to bump up in the numbers. Mm. Yeah, we will keep um, sharing that because I think it's a really important message also to to get it across to to council, and I so support that um, like the the standpoint really to think more around how to turn actually these renovation choices into climate solutions, and um, really have substantial um, opportunities to tap into renewables. Um, and I don't think it's ugly or anything. I actually think it's quite exciting. Um, so absolutely the opposite of, of that statement. So yes, please, if anyone from the council is maybe watching <laughs> or something, you know. Um, I think also Laura will not be the last one um, mm -hmm. thinking and, and tapping into that opportunity really to put um, solar panels at, at the front um, roof. Mm. So I think it's a really important part to consider and to, to give approvals for. So yes, yeah. please. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I even go a step harsher because I'm really annoyed by councils. I think they're, they're really hypocrites because you know they're demanding sustainable designs and they have all the sustainability goals and criteria on their website. And then when it actually comes to it, then they come with such, I'm sorry, nonsense, rubbish statements, you know, that you should not see solar panels or, you know, that they're against the heritage. It's really nonsense. You know, they are there to showcase, they show that you do something good. So I think they should be highlighted, they should be celebrated and they should not be hidden. So it, it makes, makes me quite quite angry because we have the issues with lots of projects and I think it's just nonsense. Just nonsense. Yeah, imagine how much extra um, energy we could all generate mm. if we were allowed like it would be a huge amount yeah would be massive Absolutely. but yeah, we, think... we, we even had a, a client they they couldn't put it on the back either because you could see it from sydney harbour somewhere oh no oh, ridiculous <laughs> it's really That's... ridiculous oh my god i, I wasn't expecting that actually no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah but weird but i think we pretty much managed to go for all our questions or maybe did it, just, is there um... something else uh we, yeah, we on on the on on the pattern, uh, not the patterns, but the um, wallpapers. So, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think you have spent a fair bit of time researching, and um, you have found actually a great company um, who is doing it very locally, in a sustainable way, right, Laura? Yeah, they they're called Publisher Textiles, and mm. um, Denby's been working with them. I think maybe a decade, in, in a way, a really long time, and it's all. Um, done by hand and um, they produce a very, very small amount of waste and then recycle all of that um, and it's non-toxic paints um, and Denby's also been working with them to um, produce some bespoke wallpaper, which you can kind of see in the top, the top right-hand corner, which is um, uh, the blue um, uh, wallpaper. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty exciting to have my own um, my own version of of a, a design that that they've uh, produced. So that yeah, that's it. that's really exciting as well. Yeah, and like it's I think the the thoughts went um, into a lot around you know the life cycle. What do you do actually at the end of life of of certain materials and products? 
repurposing, upcycling existing one, but then also being mindful, who do you choose even as a supplier? Um, and like a, picking, for example, a company who is locally producing that in a very um, conscious way. I think it's a very um, conscious investment, but it adds a very um, unique character again, I think, to the house and just supports this whole, um, yeah, like the deliverability of, of the space. And it's very unique and I, I think it's it's a fantastic way actually even to spend the money because I I find it um so refreshing to see those kind of choices than just copying what certain magazines are um promoting consistently and we we sometimes um tend to you know brush over um these things and just to um to be guided what others have but sometimes it's really worth thinking what do I want you know what do I like and what inspires me and um, letting that actually influence also the style and the design and if you have a great designer at hand um, I think that's a really interesting and very refreshing process to to be involved in. Yeah. Ah, and I can see we have a couple of questions here that we haven't addressed yet. So uh, Susanna is asking, um, sorry, where was it again? Uh, what the main reason was why you went for prefabricated panels or prefabricated wall system? Uh, yeah, there's a few reasons. So one is you have a lot more choice over the materials um, that, that go into it. So um, uh, I know um, that I can have discussions with Paul about um, where they source the, the materials from. Um, it's also made from timber, which is a renewable um, resource. Um, and then the other thing is that um, everything fits together uh, into a really tight envelope, which means that you're less likely to have um, drafts and um, all of that that kind of thing um so yeah there was a bunch of reasons oh, actually there's a write-up on the reasons up on the website as as well um and oh there's a blog on the website um mm. about why why i chose chose prefab Amazing. but yeah they're the, they're the main reasons awesome and she has a follow-up question as well susanna uh, you said that the next stage is the prefab walls uh what's the timeline before the house is uh, watertight and can they start and when they can they start focusing on the interiors do you have a time frame for that? Uh, the timelines, <laughs> I don't pay any attention to timelines anymore <laughs> at all. So sometimes it's here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be, you know, a couple of weeks um, mm. and then the um, then the roof will go on and then, then we can do the, the super fun stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. That's but good. it won't work out like that. I, I, I know how, they, how it goes. <laughs> so. But then uh, kind of a last question, and then I think we're, we're probably over time already. Uh, you know, we spoke about the sustainable wallpaper and whatnot. Uh, but the question is, how do you make actually sure that the things you put in the house are really sustainable and that there is no queen washing, you know, that is accurate? You know, how, how do you ensure that what they say is true? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's really difficult because it's expensive for suppliers to get all those yeah. green certificates. And so you have to ask them a lot of questions if they're, you know, a, a little supplier. Um, mm -hmm. So where, what materials are you using? What are you doing with your waste products? How are you recycling? All of those types. You have to actually do do that mm -hmm. that research yeah. and, and ask them. Um, the other, um, here's a big plug for you, uh, Sonia and, and Daniel and Simona, go to Evertat because that's <laughs> where I found so many of um, my solutions. Um, it, you know that's the whole that's the whole problem with this project is I had to do hours and hours and hours of research, mm -hmm. and there there is so much greenwashing and like people just put eco this and environmental that, or they've got you know some green leaves on it and then enviro like and it's it is rubbish and so mm -hmm. you have to you have to do the research yourself. But that's what's so good about Evertat now is. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, I've got Thermotech um, uh, windows and, you know, uh, that part of the research process I didn't have to follow through on because you guys had already done that. Um, but the, you know, the, the wallpaper, the tiles, um, mm -hmm. you know, paints, um, all of that kind of thing, you just have to keep asking um, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, on, on, on that note, maybe just to explain a little bit, um, I think because um, we went through the same experience after a cyclone um, caused massive damages at our house and we we wanted to build back better, better materials, um, creating more energy efficiency, but also being more conscious actually what are we choosing. And um, I had at times the feeling we are doing a PhD in certain areas, you know, around material specifics, you know, health aspects, diving deep into material compositions, even chemical compositions and so on. And I got lost often enough um, in all these details and was thinking, um, well, if, if we do this, you know, we are not the only ones, you know, like. And then, of course, you know, um, when when I talked to Laura, she has done even far more of, of that research over time. Mm -hmm. And it's all this lost, um, not just, you know, the information, actually, it's the understanding of materials. And what we want to do here with Evitat is we don't just onboard suppliers, we actually vet them. So they need to provide evidence around the sustainability claims. And that evidence can come in test results. It can be an EPD if they have that. Um, it could be even a certificate. Um, but um, some of them might be smaller, you know, and um, have incredible good products and might be a small family business. And they have a very sustainable process um, incorporated in the operational process and how they um, do the things. We want to know that and we are actually extracting all that information and make it tangible. So we have more than 35 different areas, um, how these criteria is getting applied. And, and this is exactly how um, we make it easy for everyone, like a homeowner, to understand the benefits. We also connect the benefits um, with goal setting and I might actually um, quickly see if I can share something. Give me just a second. I might just need to jump into. But maybe while, while you search for it, Sonia, yeah. one thing what I wanted to say as well is, you know, exactly like you said with the small suppliers, um, you know, there are so many amazing businesses and, and, and companies out there that do amazing things. But, you know, A, like, like you said as well, they don't have the money to pay the thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to get them certified. And the yeah. other thing is they don't have the marketing budget. You know, they might not have the money for this amazing, stunning website to do stories all the time and go out there. And the sad thing is if you Google, you just find the big players because they have the money for their marketing. And so, therefore, you know, as a consumer, it's just very hard to find those small, you know, products or suppliers that might have the perfect product for you. And this is where I really like, you know, every time while I, while I came on board as well, because, you know, it actually can help those those smaller companies, you know, that have amazing ideas, amazing products to stand out and get found by the people that need them. So I think it's really, really great. Yes. Uh, no, thank you, Simona. Um, that's a great point to, um, to even um, let everyone know. Because it is really um, a significant loss, even, you know, if, if you don't know what, what's around the corner and there might be someone, you know, doing it even for the last 20 years, but you have no clue because um, the usual way how we search, for example, and source these materials is through Google. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it's often a limited way. Um, and we... We had from Laura, for example, you know, even um, finding a water expert um, had to go through the entire globe and to come <laughs> back actually around the corner and find the expert. Yeah. So all these uh, stories um, have really encouraged us to, to, to create actually a platform which um, gives a voice to um, suppliers who really want to be um, trustworthy, transparent, and that's exactly what we want to highlight. 
So for example, in, in this case, this is live panel. It's an untreated wood fiber insulation rigid panel and can be used in particular also if you have health issues, if um, you are suffering, for example, um, from asthma and other trigger points of off-gassing materials um, into the air quality. We, we do highlight that here. And you have also all the evidence further down, um, not just the embodied carbon, but also the EPDs and the test results all displayed and you can access them easily. So um, another component of the platform is the logbook. So every single um, renovator can actually start a logbook. And with that, I just want to show you this example. This is um, a home I have created here in Melbourne, and it's based on, on the property we live in. And um, like every single added information around sustainability from windows to structural building materials, for example, will be um, captured as voluntary information. And you can really, uh, like we are consistently um, also going into more granular questions, but um, those questions have been developed um, very precisely also with the help of Simona. And we went through a fair bit of work and they getting then um, translated actually into impact. So if I remove, for example, um, the roof insulation, that will then immediately also remove some of the impact. You can see that here as well, because it is significant. Um, and the way how we are asking them, it's a little bit reverse engineered so that we are actually um, centering the, the answers around the comfort level of the home, which is a quite important part as well. So, but um, how it connects actually with even the marketplace is, if you would do, for example, a purchase, the purchase would be stored here as well. Um, so I will have very soon also a demo version of it, which will showcase also warranties, for example, or if it's a product or a system solution, it will have also um, maintenance, um, service contact details and many more things. And it will automatically be mapped against um, the impact it creates and um, we are working on, on property valuation because I think um, it is quite important at a point when you are, for example, ready to sell the home to be able actually to demonstrate that. And it's a great way to create um, a repository and then to attach that um, to the property listing. So you're not leaving that to the real estate agent to decide what's property value you are actually highlighting all these uh, multiple benefits to a potential buyer. And like we we were talking many times, Simona, about um, needs and aspirations, in particular if, if you're a property buyer and you might have even some health conditions. If you find a property which really gives you that information, um, that's a real bonus to consider to buy. And... And we can only shift um, these benefits or in general, a more conscious mindset mm -hmm. in real estate if we start actually highlighting that um, and every single more conscious renovation with um, more consciously selected material choices will be able actually to demonstrate that. Okay. It's free, so maybe to, to just add that, um, it's completely for free for homeowners um, and renovators. So jump in, um, make sure that um, you start your logbook. We are constantly also adding um, additional features and uh, a very uh, welcoming also feedback. And um, like even this webinar tonight, we are doing fairly regularly um, pretty much every two weeks, um, a certain topic in, in the webinars. And um, we are diving deep from thermal efficiency, even to sustainable materials, to design aspects, um, and really featuring even projects like, for example, the Impossible House. So yes, on that note, I want to thank everyone, in particular, um, 
Laura and John tonight, um, and Simona. Daniel, thank you as well in the background. You have managed really well, all the polls and everything. And um, yes, and please jump on the website, um, jump on our platform, sign up. And um, we we are more than happy to, to support you on that journey and to, to grow with, with everyone who is actually in, in that space and who wants to create a healthy, low carbon and climate ready home. Definitely. And maybe for anyone listening or listening to the recording, if you have found any amazing products or, you know, materials that you're using, uh, you know, that are not on our platform yet, you know, let us know, you know, maybe it's something to add. Absolutely. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Um, is there anything else? Um, like even if you have any questions coming up, um, you can also leave them even in later on in community under the link um, you, where you have started even this um, webinar. But um, I'm because I'm not quite sure where we stopped in in terms of the questions. Um, no, I think, for, yeah. I think uh, we got it. all. there was one question, but then, uh, John had just answered it in the in the chat box. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that, maybe, John? That sounds cool. Um, what what I was saying is that um, the the grey water systems that we, we found to put in uh, is is a newer one, like it's not one I've um, had installed before. But if you do have a small property, it's quite compact, and so uh, I think that's great that that that's available um, to that we can install that in in Laura's property because that's a real challenge. I think as Sonia was saying, just space for grey water treatment can be a real problem. So. Yeah. Hopefully it goes well. Oh, and the other thing is um, they're developing an even smaller one. Yeah, at the that's moment right. As well, so that would be great as well because yeah. not everyone, the New South Wales Health has required everyone to do 10-person capacity grey water treatments and this company's doing a five-person one and they're going to see if they can get that approved and that would be great because mm. most people don't have 10 people coming to the house. <laughs> <laughs> really and if they have 10 you have to say go to the neighbor to the toilet <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. uh, but yeah so i'm really looking forward to your you know to, to how your journey continues and hopefully we see you in a few months and you know it's all done it's all finished and you can celebrate thank you exactly so the next one will be the walkthrough um i'm pretty sure and yeah i'm really i'm wishing the the last bit all the best actually and um yeah and then i'm quite um looking forward to to the next webinar thank you so much thanks All everyone and wish everyone a great evening thank you thank bye. you bye bye, bye.